It's Matt solo this week. I feel so bad for Mark, who's probably in a, I don't know, Jack, did Mark say where he was? I think he's in the Bahamas, he said. So he's, oh, he's somewhere nice. Bahamas, the son of a bee. All right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm here up in, you know, and I mean, Jack's not looking too shabby either. Uh, so uh, being in Port in uh, sunny Puerto Rico. So anyways, uh, Jack is a old friend of mine um, and also a uh, friend of uh, Mark Optographs as well. So we wanted to bring him on today on this uh, solo edition. So I'm going to see how I can perform being a, uh, a solo pilot on this show here. But a little bit about Jack. Um, I'm just kind of going to do this organically because I'm not just going to go through like, you know, some uh, verbose uh, bio or anything like that. But uh, I've known Jack basically has worked across all the like spectrums of the real estate industry. Uh, known for Rochester, former RIT grad. Uh, shout out to all the RIT gradu uh, graduates out there. Um, and started in the trenches of real estate from doing the wholesaling, fix and flipping, um, foreclosure, sheriff's auction properties, that sort of thing. Uh, and then, you know, has had all this experience in terms of working on Wall Street, working with private equity companies, family offices, and to where he is right now, where he's uh, raising capital um, with uh, JCAM uh, Alternative Investments. Uh, and uh, partnering with sponsors across the country. So, Jack, I just wanted to thank you for coming uh, coming on the Misfits of Real Estate. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, we've known each other a long time. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you actually, uh, you know, your your well, you and your dad sold uh, my wife a condo uh, in Rochester, uh, her, her first condo purchase way back in the day. So, um, and you've uh, been following your career as well, and you've done great. And I'm really excited to to uh, collaborate with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I full disclosure, I had uh, Jack on uh, my show Go Big Live last week, so I definitely, you know, Mark and I take a different spin on this uh, on this show. Um, I do want for people that have never even heard of you before, kind of give us like a some brief background uh, on your background and also uh, your focus now and what you do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, I'm from New Jersey, but I went up to Rochester to attend RIT and. Uh, was uh, was there during the you know the dot com boom and thought I was going to be in information technology thought I might go work for Cisco or IBM or um, and then Google was really just getting started I'm dating myself here but uh, you know I graduated in 2001 which was during the dot com crisis mm -hmm. and uh, you know there there wasn't as much job opportunity as I thought but uh, I had a you know a good starting salary and good credit so I started buying houses no money down. I actually read a book at the airport, uh, how to do nobody down real estate. And uh, my college landlord who became a mentor of mine, you know, helped me find my first few deals. And then uh, within a year, I quit my job, started uh, flipping houses, doing some property management, wholesaling, going to the sheriff's auction, going to the tax auction. And, uh, you know, really uh, just kind of dove in head first, certainly made some mistakes, but, but learned a ton and had some successes as well. Uh, when everything froze in 2008, um, there was a lot of private equity and hedge funds buying mortgages and uh, they needed real estate people because these were a bunch of bankers who didn't really know what to do and they didn't want to get eaten alive by the local sharks that buy at the, at the sheriff's auction. So um, I was able to come in house at a, at a private equity fund uh, to help them manage their portfolio of distressed loans, non-performing and foreclosed on REOs. So I uh, was in that industry for 10 years, uh, eventually went on my own. Uh, raised some money from a family office and then partnered with a, a multi-billion dollar private equity fund and we bought billions of dollars of loans together so um, it was a really exciting time i met a character from the big short uh, who is one of the groups buying our bonds uh, but it wasn't the lifestyle i wanted it was uh, i got into real estate for that passive income and for that uh you know both financial freedom but also freedom of time and um you know unfortunately it got too wall streety after a while so um you know, I'd been investing passively in some syndications. And once I, uh, I left my firm and eventually got bought out, I uh, really built a business around investing more passively into larger real estate syndications, which I think for, for many investors, especially the higher net worth and the accredited investors is, is potentially a much better way to, uh, to invest than just investing, you know, in single family real estate with size and scale comes some benefits, including tax benefits. So um, it's, it's been a, a great pivot for, for me in my life. I, I, I love helping people. I love educating on uh, the syndication space. And, uh, you know, it's been it's been a great ride. So something that was surprising to me, Jack, was that I thought that to become a syndicator, that you had to raise the capital and find the opportunity as well. And you told me that 
that's not necessarily true. So tell us about that. Yeah, it's something that I, you know, certainly learned uh, over time as well. And it came from one of my mentors who's also someone I was investing passively with uh, as well. So um, it, it's really tough to find good opportunities and, you know, whether it's small or, or large scale. So most operators, and I'll use the term syndicator and operator uh, interchangeably, um, but they're the ones that are the boots on the ground. And they'll often look at two to 300 deals to find one good deal to invest in. And so once they find that deal, they've got 45 or 60 days often to raise millions of dollars because these, you know, I'm talking about larger deals. Sometimes it's a $30 million acquisition where you need to raise $10 million in 30 to 60 days. Mm -hmm. Even the best operators, you know, they have their friends and family money, et cetera. But to raise 10 million in a short period of time, it's, it's extremely nerve wracking. And you have a hard deposit down most of the time where if you don't raise all that money, you might lose a million dollars of a hard deposit. So because of that, they look for partners that are in the capital raising business or have their own funds as well that can raise larger checks. So yeah, they may raise five on a $10 million deal. An operator may have 5 million from their friends and family, but that other five, either they're dialing for dollars, talking to strangers, trying to raise $50,000 from another 50 to hundred people, or mm -hmm. they go to somebody like me who's already invested with them and has basically built a business around not chasing the 200 deals to find the one good one, but I've got five to 10 groups that look at those 200 deals and each send me one deal a year. So I might do 10 deals out of 2,400 deals that, that operators are looking at. And because we can raise larger amounts of money and because we're consistently investing and partnering with them, we get special terms. So often there's no additional fees for us being involved. We're actually a partner in the deal. And, uh, you know, by being a partner in a deal, we're essentially bringing our investors in alongside the, uh, you know, the operating partners or sponsors that have the, are the ones that found the deal. And they're the ones that are generally going to do the day to day operations going forward. I often get what, you know, what I call like a board seat or I'm on the committee. I'll, I'll definitely sit in on calls and, and, you know, I'm more aware of what's happening than, say, my passive investors, although we do do great reporting. Uh, mm -hmm. But, yeah, that's, that's the gist of it is uh, there's room for people to just raise capital. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that was something that was a completely foreign concept to me. And actually, I'd love to be in that space eventually as well, because I'm on the distribution list for a lot of different operators. And myself being an active operator, the one that needs to find the opportunities. I mean, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. Like, I look at hundreds of properties, make tons of offers, and we usually land one deal a year. And so and it, it's a lot of freaking work that goes into that. So it's almost like you bring that essential piece to the component and the capital raising is, you know, outside friends and family is one thing. When you tap outside of friends and family, it becomes a lot more difficult to raise capital um, because now you're dealing with more people that are used to investing in syndications or used to investing in funds and they get presented a lot of opportunities. And now even capital raising has become that more, much more harder now that the music has sort of stopped playing with the multifamily space. So, uh, so now people like you and people like I aspire to be eventually in terms of the capital raising space, uh, add a tremendous amount of value to the equate, uh, to the equation for operators out there, uh, that are looking for investment capital. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you hit the nail on the head where it's not easy, but also what I'd like to add is, you know, a great majority of my initial investors had never invested in a syndication before. So there's a lot of education that needs to go along. And I, I was in New York and even a lot of our vendors and people I did business with that weren't in New York that, you know, were, you know, had seven figure businesses, you know, multi-million, multi-millionaires that had almost all their money just in stocks and bonds. Maybe they owned a vacation home or one property themselves, but, you know, the entire syndication industry of how a deal is structured how there's a preferred return, how there's a profit split. It's foreign to many investors, even those that are multimillionaires. So, you know, it takes someone that they have the personal relationship that they have that, that they know they like and they trust that they can, you know, understand that, you know, this is how things are structured, that it's not too good to be true. Um, and I, I've had a lot of conversations about that of like, well, uh, a REIT pays an 8% dividend. How are you paying an, you know, a, an 8% preferred return and giving 70% of the profits so that a return could be, 15 to 20 percent and just having to walk them through just why why it makes sense why 
a private deal that doesn't have the exposure of being able to go on E-Trade and click a button to buy is going to mm -hmm. offer a higher return, how it's more like owning or investing in a business that has a profit margin than it is investing in a stock where it's you know a very efficient market and most of the data is priced in and it's going to be going to trade more like the S&P. So, um, you know, this is a relatively new industry. It's really there's been private placements for 50 years, but it's really been since 2012 when the government changed the the rules for uh, for the regulation D private placements where advertising has been allowed. Before mm -hmm. that, you had to, you know, they were called country club deals. You literally had to know someone and it was pretty much illegal to advertise and you could only talk to people with pre-existing relationships. So it was really tough to find these deals until 10 years ago. My next question is on the side of, you know, you talk to operators, you meet with operators that you partner with. What is your step-by-step -step vetting process for when you're deciding to build a relationship with a operator and actually do a business with them? Sure. And that's, uh, it's definitely evolved over time. Um, you know, some of the initial deals were a lot more, probably a lot more of the way that some of my investors are with me. It's like, okay, we, I, I knew someone already, um, you know, or a friend referred in and it was, you know, we, we, you know, did, you know, look at the deal, talk to the sponsors, a little more gut and feel. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, there's a, you know, a whole checklist of, of items, both on the sponsor side and the property side. Um, you know, just what is their experience? What is their track record? Um, certainly, you know, like sponsors that have been through a crash and have a couple of gray hairs that, that have been through a cycle, but that's, that's not a hard requirement. Um, mm -hmm. you know, cause the, it's also some of the, some of the younger hustlers are the ones that find the really good deals as well. Cause they're the ones that are aggressive and knocking on the doors. So, um, yeah, first things first is a sponsor, you know, just making sure, you know, ethically and core values and, you know, are we comfortable working and do business with them? Do we have mutual contacts? It's very rare we're working with anybody just off the street. Um, I'm in a number of mastermind groups. So, um, you know, anyone that we don't, we don't already invest with is usually coming from a, a trusted source, a mastermind group, or, you know, a very close contact or investor. Um, then it comes down to the, to the property side. And, um, you know, there's, there's a ton of dynamics, obviously, and every deal is different. But you know, one of the core asset classes I'll just focus on because it's probably half or more of our business is the value add component. And it's mm -hmm. typically, you know, a, an, you know, a nice building, but old and dated. Um, mm -hmm. you know, for example, something built in the 80s that still has some original kitchens and bathrooms in it where you know, the rents are maybe $1,200. But with a new kitchen, new bathroom, new flooring, you get fifteen or $1,600. Mm -hmm. And we really hone in on does is that plan do we believe in that plan do we trust the comparables you know where, what is the purchase price of the building is it in line with comparables if the rents you know it's basically just running through the numbers and the one thing you can control is that budget now if the economy crashes and everyone's out of work maybe it's different but you know you can't really control interest rates you can make some projections you can't really control where cap rates are in five years but if you nail that value add component that's the the top thing we look for when, when looking at whether to make a decision to invest or not, is do we believe they're going to be able to raise those rents? Because at least if they execute on that part of it, that's probably 70% of success with the model. And then some of it is just, you know, where timing and where cap rates are. There's some, some deals that people made crazy returns in 2021 when interest rates went to zero. And uh, I mean, we personally doubled our money on a deal in 12 months and two days. Mm -hmm. um, the pro forma was an 18% return. Mm -hmm. in you know, average we have like an IRR over three years and we double our money in one year. So um, crazy things can happen, but we would have made money on that deal regardless just because the, the rents increased by, by so much. It just happened. We sold in a year. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that, those are the, the two main components. And then it's, uh, you know, we do look at how is their reporting? Are they reporting on time on other properties? Um, do they get their tax documents out? Um, most people, unfortunately, we have to file extensions in this business because, um, it's rare that all the K-1s come in before April 15th, but, um, you know, we did have a sponsor who's, uh, you know, on our, uh, you know, on our naughty list right now because their, their K-1 was very late. It didn't, it didn't come out till you know, close to end of summer. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's been a, a one-time issue. Uh, but yeah, I mean, K-1s are very important and, uh, uh, especially for new investors, you know, if you've never had a K-1, it's, you know similar to a 1099, but different. It's just a separate tax form that you get and you provide to your accountant. And usually it's going to show a negative number, which is in this case, good, because it's it's actually showing that number on paper from depreciation, which allows you to 
to defer some of your tax income. If you have other rental properties, you can offset. It's a, it's a very powerful thing for those that can take advantage of it. And it's, a, it's one of the key reasons I invest in this industry. So you mentioned the the K1 thing there. Now there's a daisy chain thing that can happen here in terms of this whole industry. So you know, traditionally, um, for those of you who aren't, don't have partnership returns, your tax return isn't due on the 15th of April, it's due on the 15th of March. So putting yourself in the standpoint of, of Jack's position is that he's partners in a partner, in a partnership so that their return is going to be like it's gonna, it's gonna be due by 15th, but I almost have to get it in before the 15th because you guys have to do your thing as well with that. So tell me about that. Sure. So yeah, we, we're definitely, you know, we, we notified all of our investors a month ago and, and pretty much any new investor that's coming in is like, you know, you're gonna file an extension. Mm -hmm. Now we've got probably 75% of our K1s in already, but mm -hmm. there's a few that we know are not gonna show up before April 15th. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's complex. There's a few groups that have multiple properties in them. And then, you know, you need to finalize the return for each property before you can then finalize the return for the fund. And then we need, you know, two weeks to turn around RK1. So, um, you know, I've, I've frankly filed an extension probably every year since 2002 or three for myself. So um, it's not really an issue for me. But for those that are coming in that have been mostly W2 and don't have a lot of alternative investments, it might be a new thing. Uh, but that same issue comes up in September. Certain people who have trusts, their deadline is September 15th, not October 15th. The deadline mm -hmm. for individual is October 15th. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant battle and it's just something that, you know, when you're, when you're investing in these private deals, that is just kind of part of, it's, the, it's part of doing business. Um, mm -hmm. You know, best case scenario though, you're getting a bigger refund or you're actually saving money on your other property. So it's worth the wait because you're, you know, you're saving money anyway, and you'll get, you know, either, either a bigger refund than you would have, or uh, have to pay less if you're uh, in that spot where you have a lot of other passive income. Yeah. I'm trying to think of ways that uh, mechanisms and may, I don't know, maybe you have, maybe you have them, or maybe it's just like, it's, it's just, you know, it's just like, Hey, this is what is supposed to happen. And I trust you to make that happen. But what makes me think is like, if, cause if, with me, thank God I have, you know, my partner, David Martin, because he handles all the operations of the company and he gets the, you know, he gets all their tax returns and partnership tax returns, like, like way ahead of time, like, on, like clockwork is preparing for it at the end of the year. Me personally, I'm a mess. Like I, I, I file and extension and I'm like filing on October 15th, like every year. Right. Um, so I'm wondering like if there's a mechanism with sponsors where you could be like, okay, if you miss your deadline in terms of when you get it in by this date, then you get penalized, you get penalized for do it for doing that. Because we, this we, is we're constantly thinking of that. I, I will just give it a quick antidote. Uh, I was on a Zoom uh, last week with one of the masterminds I'm in where we have probably 30 investors mm -hmm. and a group presented a new deal. And I previously, separate from this group, I previously invested with this group. And they're doing great performance wise, but their K1 was pretty late last year. And I called them out in front of 30 people that, uh -huh. you know, hey, you know, you guys are doing great. I could vouch for you operationally, but, you know, I've got a bone to pick with you. And that K1 was very late. Like, can you commit to getting your K1s on time for this next deal? So even without a financial penalty, just the, you know, when you have future investment dollars, um, you know, there's no bigger incentive than future investment dollars in a, a long term relationship to uh, to build. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. And I, I hate to belabor the subject matter, but I remember one time um, I was, uh, this was the first time I was doing a partnership term with a, um, with a high net worth individual that we did a joint venture with, by the way, full disclosure for anybody listening to that, any listen to this or watching it, I've never done a, I've never done a syndication before as an actual sponsor, like a sponsor or anything like that. I've invested passively in deals before, but every deal that I've done as a, as like a lead person has always been a joint venture. And this, uh, you know, it was like getting down to the wire and it, this partner called me up and he was a major investor of mine. And he was like, if I have to file for an extension, then I'm not going to invest with you anymore. And I was like, oh crap, I cannot let this happen ever, ever again. Um, so, and thus, uh, you know, long story, long story short, we have uh, Mr. David, uh, David Martin on board with Oak Grove Development uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. So uh, moving forward a little bit, um, I guess what are some major red flags with you know that you spot with potential sponsors that you meet that other people could be aware of? 
Um, yeah, so, you know, especially given the last year or two, it's like, are, do they have problems with any of their, their current deals? Um, that, that's certainly, even if the new deal is, you know, an amazing deal, like we do look at, do they have, are they going to have legacy issues? Because, mm -hmm. you know, maybe their current infrastructure is supported by some other properties, but if they're going to, if they're losing money on other properties, it may affect their, their performance. Um, yeah, we certainly look at the underwriting and just somebody who's way too optimistic with underwriting, um, you know, just showing, you know, banking on just rent growth, cap rate compression or just selling at aggressive numbers. I mean, the, the deal, you know, you, you need to you need to underwrite conservatively right now, especially after what we've seen with the crazy moves in interest rates, uh, the mm -hmm. increases in insurance costs, increases in property taxes in some markets, um, you know, just seeing somebody who, um, you know, it just raises red flags that maybe they lack experience or they're just being too optimistic and just uh, doing whatever they, uh, you know, they, they can to, you know, to try to get the deal closed and mm -hmm. uh, you know, just you know, a lack of references. I mean, anybody who's, you know, I think a quality, a quality operator sponsor is going to have, uh, you know, a number of, of investors who are you know, willing to sing their praises and, and, uh, and give a positive recommendation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are the key ones. So on the optimism in regard to pro forma underwriting, I mean, one of the things is that when I, I underwrite deals so conservatively that my my projections look like crap. <laughs> so um, and I've always made a point of, uh, point of that. And in, in terms of like if if I'm looking at uh, if I'm looking at projections on a property that make me excited, then I should be then I should be actually concerned. <laughs> what do you say to that? You know, I think the the best case scenario and our most sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, partners, sponsors, operators, um, just build out a sensitivity analysis. Then you can then you can look at all scenarios and you can kind of figure out where you're most comfortable. Um, yeah, you could look at an exit. Yeah, there are deals where it's like, yeah, if if the ten year drops to three percent in the next twenty four months, it's not out of the question. You exit at a four and a half, four point seven five cap. That can easily be in a table. If we sell at this cap rate and we've gotten this rent growth, this is the number. If we only get to this cap rate, and then you have all the then you have all the possible scenarios, and you never know which one is right. But you know, you can look at your you know, you've got a good margin for error, and you know what your worst case and your best case scenario is, and and then you can make an educated decision. So um, I'm not that Excel guy. I'm not the one who could build that. But uh, <laughs> fortunately, in commercial real estate, there's a ton of just very experienced, you know, analysts and quants that can, you know, can generate, um, you know, all the scenarios in Excel. Now, now, granted, you need your own to just make sure that, uh, you know, the numbers all, all tie out. But ultimately, when you get to those tables, it's it's coming from a couple of data points. What's the net operating income? What's the cap rate? Uh, and, you know, where, where are interest rates at the time? So um, it's yeah. really, it's, it ends up not that complicated. It's just, you know, end of the day, it's simple math, but um, it's amazing the things you could do with, uh, you know, with Excel these days. That's actually, that's actually a great point. I mean, it's something I'm actually going to take into consideration because when I put together my pro formas, I've actually had, uh, I've actually had uh, investors being like, Matt, like, this doesn't look like a good deal. Like, why are, like, why are you even excited about it? And because I, I present it in one way, right? My super conservative, uh, my super conservative way. And I know in the back of my mind is like, I'm going to blow these numbers out of the water. I just know it, but I don't want to make that promise to people that are going to be partners with us with the expectation of, let it, of like letting them down. So I'll definitely have to use that in the, in the future in terms of the sensitivity analysis. So then I can leave it on that. It's like, this is the way, you know, conservatively that I'm thinking in terms of like, you know, not doomsday scenario in terms of like fire and brimstone falling out of the sky, but from the scenario of like, you know, the like the most likely worst case scenario um, and then including a sensitivity analysis so that so that they can kind of come to their own conclusions, because there might be investors that are like more optimistic than you are about uh, about deals and kind of leaving that decision to them in terms of what type of inclination that they want to have uh, towards a deal, I think is pretty smart. Um, so. Let's move on to what you're doing currently. Are you currently raising for a fund or any opportunities as of right now or what? Uh, yeah, so we actually have two different funds. We run three funds total, one of which we've closed to new investors and it's essentially at its wind down period as properties sell, we're returning, you know, returning cash. 
most mm -hmm. of those investors are then you know, reinvesting into one of our future funds. So we run, we have two funds that are open right now. One is our diversified fund. And that fund where we raise for about two years. And as we raise money, we're investing into one of those opportunities. I mentioned we get 10 to 12 opportunities a year. So you know, we raise money every month uh, you know, as we have investors come in and there's always something solid available that we can invest in within 30 to 45 days. So we have very little cash sitting on hand. Yeah. And then separately, last year, we opened up a uh, separate platform that allows investors to choose from individual deals. So we'll put those 10 to 12 deals a year up and give investors a window to invest directly into that property. And it functions like a somewhat of a crowdfunding platform or brokerage account where, where people can invest still through one fund, but the fund is customizable and you can choose exactly which asset to invest in. And uh, you know, right now we have a few different options uh, on there. There's a, a multifamily apartment complex in Dallas um, that is that exact value add scenario I mentioned where you know it's an 80s built uh, product, you know, Dallas is booming and there's mm -hmm. such a demand for that workforce middle-class housing where yeah. you know, if you take units that we call classic units that haven't been renovated in 10 or 15, 20 years, and put you know new kitchen cabinets, new bathroom, new flooring. There's a really high demand for that tenant that's pay, that needs to pay that fourteen, fifteen hundred dollar rent that'll pay for a quality unit that can't afford to pay twenty two hundred, twenty five hundred to live in you know the colony or uh, Frisco and the really uh, you know high end expensive parts of Dallas. Um, we also have a private lending fund on there as well um, that just does short term high interest rate bridge loans for for real estate investors. So that's more of an open ended fund. Um, but, you know, pays double digit returns, um, quarterly payouts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a, uh, uh, a Dallas deal we're looking at right now. And uh, oh, we also the most unique thing we've invested in is an art. It's a marina that has an RV park component mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, 10 cap entry. Um, so that means, you know, overall returns are mid teens or, or better um, mm -hmm. for that. And it's a, it's a niche asset class. And, uh, you know, much like self storage was 10 or 15 years ago, there there's most of these uh, RV parks and marinas are owned by mom and pops. And, yeah. uh, you know, the one of the examples they gave is they had a whiteboard with individual like uh, rectangular post it notes for each dock. And they were tracking who paid their rent by marking like a Roman numeral on the on the post it note per year. So that's effective. They, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and they had, you know, 15 family members cell phones on their plans so you know they're running the business like a family business not you know like a like a private equity fund so there's so much room for for efficiencies when when you're you know buying a business off of uh you know say you know just a you know someone who's didn't need to wring every dollar out of it because they owned it a long time and you know they're using it to kind of employ or support some family members and running it as like half, half a business half a charity <laughs> um, yeah so those are some of the things we're doing we i just before this call was on a call about a uh industrial building we, we do love industrial um it's uh you know as there's more reshoring happening in the u.s um i think there's going to be more manufacturing jobs more industrial um there's a lot of logistics uh and just think about all the you know electricians heating and air conditioning they all need um some place they don't need big offices but they need a you know they need a warehouse storage workshop and then uh, perhaps maybe a you know a small little office for a couple desks or you know a couple garage bays. So um, record low vacancy in the light industrial. There's definitely uh, a supply shortage in, in in most markets for that. So that's it's an asset class we keep an eye on as well. But at least half of what we do is that cookie cutter multifamily value add. That's that's something that's a core, and I expect will remain a core of our business. Then we look for interesting asset classes for the other diversification. So you have an anchor in multi value add multifamily, but it sounds like you're opportunistic for other asset classes. Am I summarizing that correctly? Uh, ab absolutely. And what we like about some of those other asset classes is the, the cash flow is generally a little higher. Um, mm -hmm. You know that industrial, um, it's you know might be you know eight percent cash on cash day one, whereas mm -hmm. in multifamily, a lot of times, especially the first year while you're going through the value add component, sometimes there's only three to five percent cash flow. Uh, the mm -hmm. first year and you need to kind of wait for your renovations to, you know, to increase the rents to get your cash flow up towards that, you know, that eight, eight to 10 percent. Let's talk about the marina for a second, because that just sounds like a marina slash RV park sounds like an absolutely bizarre, like I'm just talking from a visceral standpoint. So tell me about how that deal like came to you. I mean, it must have been I, I it was probably something you weren't searching for. So tell me about that story. 
Yeah, so um, I went on an investor cruise last year. Uh, it was on a Royal Caribbean boat, and there was about 150 investors, you know, that were that were on the boat. You know, there's 5,000 people on the ship, but yeah, you know, we had a conference room during the sea days. There was events and presentations, and I I spoke and talked a little bit about syndication investing. Um, one of the you know now uh, someone who's a partner in the marina uh, now, but at the time still had her broker dealer license. So their first fund was actually represented by a broker dealer, and mm -hmm. You know, that, that's not a requirement by any means, but you know, when you're actually represented by a broker dealer, there's also a level of diligence that the broker dealer has to do to take you on as a client. So at least yeah. from an initial elevator pitch for this, you know, asset that I, I mean, RV parks, I'm, were, you know, something I'm somewhat familiar with, especially, yeah. um, it's a, it's a pretty hot asset class, but the Marina side of it, I was a little, you know, a little apprehensive because it just, I, I didn't really know anything about it. Uh, but you know that was the initial meeting. We got to spend a, you know a week on a on a cruise ship networking, and uh, you know got back and then had a conference call with the uh, um, you know the ownership team. I, I visited them uh, in uh, in Dallas. And uh, what was good about that deal too is they'd already bought the marinas. They were just finishing their their raise, so they had already closed on them and were operating. But there there was another less than a million dollars left that they that they wanted to raise for capital improvements. So gotcha. I got to see the numbers ahead of time too. So that, that made it a lot easier to, to dip, dip our toe into that investment that we already saw positive progress in the, you know, in their, their net operating income, just from the time they took over. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it made it made it a lot easier. And, and look, it's not, it's not that much of a departure from anything else. You've got recurring revenue. Um, this one is, this one was in Tennessee, by the way. So, you know, you don't have to worry about the, the water freezing, but, uh, you've got recurring <laughs> revenue and you have a value add component. Whatever we look at, we look for where is, you know, where is the value add? And in this scenario, uh, back in the 80s, more people had sailboats. Now mm -hmm. everyone's got power boats. They want a wakeboard. They want a tube. So mm -hmm. there was a waiting list for covered docks. And this marina had some covered docks with a waiting list. But there's other docks that were set up for sailboats that don't have covers on them that, mm -hmm. that could be monetized. So business plan day one is build, cover the docks. Um, mm -hmm. right, people, they go out tubing for an hour, then they want to sit in the shade, drink a couple Miller lights, maybe watch the <laughs> game. And, uh, you know, and, and that's unlocking significant amount of, uh, of extra revenue just from that. Um, mm -hmm. Additionally, there's houseboats on the property. So they're actually doing Airbnb and VRBO for houseboats. Wow. That, that don't move. And, and so, so it was a bit of a departure, but ultimately it wasn't, it's still a real estate play. And, uh, you know, by the time we dove in, it really wasn't that much different than, uh, you know, than, uh, than any other real estate deal that we've done in the past. Let's talk about RV parks and arenas from a financing perspective, because I'm not familiar. I'm familiar with financing mobile home parks, AKA manufactured housing communities, apartments, industrial retail, all that stuff with there being maybe, you know, short, shorter term. I mean, they, there may be yearly contracts for RVs. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but like, how does that like, the seasonality and all that stuff play into actual like bank financing and that type of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly a niche product. And, uh, you know, I think a, a, a greater chunk of the financing is going to be that community regional bank that's familiar with the area. Um, I do believe that one of the marinas though has a Fannie Mae loan. Um, so it's not out of the question. Um, and then depending on the location, um, I, you know, there's certain scenarios. I think you might even be able to do a USDA, uh, you know, type of loan. So there is there is potential for some government loans, but it's definitely going to lean more towards community, regional banks, and not a product. You know, multifamily has both Fannie, Freddie, HUD, and a ton of you know Wall Street backed or you know non bank lenders that securitize into CMBS. This is definitely more of a regional product. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, with it, and then to to your uh, question on on the recurring, I mean, it's a very very sticky asset. Um, people, you know, people don't want to move their boats for, you know, unless there's like a major life event, it's not, it's, it's, it's way stickier than multifamily. Um, so from a, you know, from a stability of the P and L and balance sheet for the banks to get comfortable, it's, it's, it's pretty stable. Um, you know, this one Marina also does have like a restaurant. So there, there's some, there's a little bit of business income, food and beverage, but you know, a fair amount of the, of the revenue is recurring. And then, um, you know, similar the Airbnb houseboat component. Um, that's a little more seasonal, but you know, they've got a number of years of, uh, you know, track record. And, you know, certainly as we, as we move forward towards a long-term refinance, uh, I expect those numbers to, to increase. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, overall, I feel like it falls into the, the baby boomer 
you know, the average owner of a boat's, you know, in their 50s or closer to retirement, too. And I think as, you know, as boomers, you know, as more boomers retire, there's likely to be more boat ownership. And uh, um, it's, you know, the economy can be cyclical, but, you know, in a down economy, more people may do closer to a staycation or, you know, drive an hour or two to a lake instead of, uh, you know, flying to Europe. So mm-hmm. I, I think it's pretty recession resistant as well. And, and generally those that own boats are a little more affluent uh, mm-hmm. as well. So, you know, whereas, you know, at least the last year, the class C, the lowest end of the apartments seem to be squeezed the most because of inflation. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like this is a, a protective play because, you know, somebody who already owns a boat, um, you know, likely isn't going to miss their payment because, uh, you know, a gallon of milk went up uh, 50 cents or eggs went up. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. So I want to go back because I did have a question about this unique scenario that you were doing one format in terms of a fund. Like, what was the impetus or what was the catalyst for you creating this second thing, which was a unique option of uh, people being able to customize and that sort of thing with what they were investing in? Like, was there... Was there like a, a you know marketplace need you were seeing out there? Was it you were hearing from investors that like, hey, I like these deals and this, but I don't like this in this fund? Like, tell me about that. Uh, yeah, we definitely took feedback from investors, and I, I had a, a pretty good idea that there was money uh, that would in, would have invested if it was in the individual deal that was not investing because they they didn't you know they really didn't like funds and they wanted to control it. And it comes down to as I've looked at you know are the investors we work with we really have two i'll use a little marketing term here two avatars if you will of the type of investors you know one is just you know moving money out of the stock market wants to do some real estate but doesn't want to do it themselves you know mm-hmm. the, the doctors the executive the tech person um hiring any hiring professional or business owner um uh, mm-hmm. that just wants an allocation wants to do something outside the stock market and uh you know they're, they they're a much better fit for the diversified fund um they they're you know it's it gives them the diversification across multiple assets multiple partners multiple sponsors uh the other group we've done a lot with is the tired landlord um they've they already own some properties they know the business they're already making a lot of money in rents so they have passive income and especially the older ones that have owned properties a long time they might have depreciated them all the way and Mm -hmm. so they're actually paying tax on their rental income Mm-hmm. They know real estate. They want to look at every deal. They they just they they want the action. They mm-hmm. you know they they want to see it. They want to understand it. They they they, they still they still want the the you know kind of the excitement of looking at a deal, but they know how much work it is in the back end, and they actually you know are making a conscious decision to start investing more passively, and the tax benefits are great for them as well. So that that type of group has been you know a group that that loves the platform, loves to invest in, in the individual deals. And, uh, you know, we, we do a deep dive. They, they understand the asset and, you know, I think they, they generally, you know, they know if something's going up on there, it's cause I like it already and I'm likely investing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a convenient way for them to, you know, look at individual deals and decide whether they're in or not. And, and also just manage their portfolio. Sometimes towards the end of the year, there's a big need for that depreciation. So, Sometimes, you know, a lot our deals in the fourth quarter almost always have the highest amount of cost sag where for every dollar you invest, you might get 70, 80, 90 percent loss on paper for your taxes. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it gives the flexibility to really focus on those deals. Um, some people want more cash flow and less upside just because they're, you know, working towards retirement, need cash flow. Others, pure growth. They have enough cash flow and they just want the best overall return and the highest, highest overall equity multiple on their invested dollar. Mm-hmm. I think that's smart. So going on, because I, I just have some commentary here too. It's like, I would, I mean, this is no offense. Like I would never invest in a, like a, in a marina or RV park. I don't understand the business. Like I don't want to be any like, but you know, okay, no, there's a value at apartment community in, da- in Dallas. I like that market. It has long-term growth potential. I'm an investor that's not motivated by cash flow right now, but by equity multiple, like long-term equity multiple. Um, so I think that was smart to offer that customization in there. Now getting down to like the granular detail here. So it's like, let's say you have, a, you know, your fund is going to be investing in the Dallas deal. And then you're going to have these other investors that are going to be on a one-off into this deal. How does it sort of like get like, I don't know, 
broken up mechan like mechanically in terms of those two those two things? Like, are they just have different membership interest in the uh, in the LLC that owns the building, or what? Cor correct. So each of those funds is it's two completely separate entities mm -hmm. that are just investing side by side each other. So there's no commingling of the two funds. The fund doesn't invest through the other fund. We're both facing the property level entity or the fund if it's like a you know the marinas has a few different marinas in it so yeah we're both co-investing directly in the deal side by side with no uh really the only the only relationship really is both vehicles are getting better terms and that's just mm -hmm. part of just us negotiating better terms because we're a partner in the deal yeah. and uh yeah that's really just it's just sort of the benefit of, of investing at scale um and, and the fact that i have you know I may, I may have a part of the partnership. I may be on, you know, kind of the equivalent of on the board or on a committee or have more insight into what's going on just because of my relationship. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a workshop coming up in April. I'm really excited for you to come into, into Rochester and also to uh, hear about, you know, to, for you to share your background and uh, all of the gory details that were involved from, you know, cause it sounds like, you know, uh, you've had a, and this is leading up to my next question. You've had the history of like getting your butt kicked and then having to adapt and adapting pretty well to your environment in adverse conditions. Was this something that was like you were born with or was it something like you just had to do it out of survival, like out of survival? Like just kind of tell me about your story about how you've been able to build this skill set of adaptability throughout your career. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely either born or very early on, you know, knew I had this drive. Um, you know, my I had great parents who kind of told me I could do anything I set my mind to, but I watched them struggle. I think what really built in that that drive is just like watching them stress over money at a young age and wanting to, you know, to make it and not have that stress myself. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that part was was built in, and uh, I think got me, you know, that that initial drive, and is what caused me to. You know, want to really why I went into computers. I liked computers, but I remember seeing some magazine of like, you know, highest paying majors, computer science, 50 something thousand back in the 90s, which, mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, going through the adversity, um, you know, I mean, I had, you know, I had a tough year or two, like a lot of people did in 07, 08, everything. And, and Rochester wasn't nearly as bad as, say, you know, Phoenix or Vegas, but, you know, the financing had froze. So it was really, and we, I was still young and undercapitalized, and it was really, you know, the whole business got turned upside down and, and had to, you know, figure out at about a year where I just didn't know what I was going to do and just, you know, persevere in Rochester and just do the best I could. And, you know, it happened to, you know, that this new opportunity popped up. But, you know, it's just always moving forward, always, you know, always just continuing to, you know, network, look for opportunities and, uh, you know, not certainly not being overly optimistic to that you make bad decisions, but just, just know that there's, there's in every, in every cycle, there's a ton of opportunities. So that, that was, um, yeah, I think the early perspective and then just sort of learning through, you know, having, having some success from the downturns. And now, I mean, when the COVID happened, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I'm not going to say I didn't have some anxiety, especially that we weren't going into some zombie apocalypse, but um, <laughs> when the stock market was down 30%. It's like, okay, I've seen this before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't panic sell actually bought some stuff at the bottom um mm -hmm. yeah, i don't do a lot with the stock market but you know just the money i had i was not panicking and then real estate wise i just knew i knew you know even if things get bad there's going to be opportunities to buy and um you know having aligned myself over the years also with you know some well capitalized private equity funds and other groups that you know i, I knew one way or another there's going to be a way to capitalize on you know on the deal flow uh just mm -hmm. by being prepared and having uh just building building relationships trying to add value However, however I can, uh, regardless, which is you know why why I do what I what I do right now, and I love educating. I love, you know, if, you know one of the things we'll talk about at the workshop is you know how I created my fund and how someone else could create a fund. I don't I don't look at that as I'm creating new competition. Um, you know, I have that abundance mentality where you know a rising tide uh, raises all ships, and you know maybe someone in that group starts their own fund and we co-invest together on a deal and we both get better terms because of it. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, the uh, no, I'm really excited for it. For those of you guys who are listening in or actually watching this right now, uh, we have a workshop that's on Saturday, April 13th. That is in downtown Rochester. Uh, Jack is coming back into the Rock, and it is at nine o'clock in the morning. It's a half day workshop. We end at twelve. 
weather pending, we'll be able to walk over to Dinosaur Barbecue afterwards and maybe have a couple of Miller Light, Miller Lights or Jenny Lights. Yeah, let's call it Jenny Lights because we want to be. Uh, oh, that's right. Oh, I missed that Wango Tango hot sauce. Oh, I haven't had that in years. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so I mean, we're going to go into Jack's origin story. Uh, we're going to go into the specific mechanics of uh, like how to start a fund, mechanics around uh, like scripts and talk tracks around how to build your OPM, uh, your OPM prowess as a real estate investor. And also, uh, thirdly, I'm excited to actually dive into some like case studies that Jack is going to have prepared for historic deals he's done in terms of those slide, you know, those slide decks or pitch decks on there um, that uh, is going to, you know, you'll be able to walk away with a lot of uh, actionable type of stuff. Um, and it's going to be valuable to those people, like not only people that want to position themselves to raise capital, but also those people that are the tired landlords that want to learn how to vet sponsors how the actual how it how the like it everything happens behind the curtains from a mechanical standpoint because most investors all we know is S P five hundred index funds or Charles Schwab mutual fund or Fidelity low price you know low price stock index that sort of thing this is a completely different industry so if you are looking to get educated on investing in an asset class that where you can actually take advantage of market inefficiency which is you know, where a lot of money is actually made in real estate, you got to be educated as an investor. And this is what you're going to learn at the workshop as well. If you're interested in how to learn how to passively invest, um, they're gonna, you're going to get a lot out of this uh, workshop as well. Um, the early bird rate of 89 bucks expires on Sunday. So don't pay stupid tax. You know, if you're looking at getting this, uh, this uh, workshop, definitely go in and get that before Sunday. It goes up to 129 bucks. Um, and then... Uh, we have a, um, uh, uh, what is it? Yeah. And then we're going to be, I mean, this thing, we're actually getting close to selling this thing out uh, in terms of uh, capacity. So definitely jump in and uh, take advantage of that. Um, and uh, you'll be also supporting a nonprofit, which is Freedom First Real Estate Investors Association, where our mission is to uh, help empower those to build community and fellowship and also to educate uh, education and real estate investing with the idea of building multi-generational wealth for people and their families so um we're almost to the top of the hour jack um what words of advice do you have or anything out that you're seeing out there anything in terms of closing remarks um that uh, you'd like to put before we wrap it up um yeah i'll just uh, i'll add one thing on the tired landlord thing is that tax side of it which i mentioned briefly but uh there's also some very custom things that can be done with 1031 exchanges so in addition to vetting sponsors if you've got a portfolio of properties, you could actually 1031 into a passive investment in many cases and do that completely tax deferred. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something I'll cover a bit. You know, it could be a little complex, but at least I'll cover enough that uh, you can learn and have a more detailed conversation if you're in that spot where you want to maybe try to sell off some properties and you're afraid of the tax hits. Um, just overall, just uh, I think yeah, you, you said it great. We're going to have a ton of content available, a ton of uh, ton of value we're going to drop at the event. Um, the key is just to take action. I know there's also an event Thursday before, right? The, the larger real estate club. So if you want a preview, you can come the Thursday night um, and just go to the, the general uh, real estate uh, investor meeting. And uh, that's the first step of, of, of really taking control of your life is to, is to, you know, just get some level of education, meet other investors, um, you know, meet the industry experts, but also just meet other investors, some of who are beginners as well, some of whom are a year or two ahead of you. And I've always found that person that's a year or two ahead, but it's not so far ahead is always a great person to, to, to learn from and just give you the perspective that, you know, it's not, it's none of this is rocket science and it's not that heavy of a lift if you just take a few steps at a time. So uh, yeah, I'd encourage everyone to come out. I'm really excited to make my return to Rochester and to, uh, to meet everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, Jack, you brought up a good point, too, is that uh, we do also have a Jackson be coming in on Thursday, April 11th for a preview, which can be like a very, very like a mini high level. Um, if you are available for the Saturday workshop, get your tickets now. If there's if you just can't make it to the Saturday workshop, then Thursday will be a good um, a good segue into getting some Q&A, learning high level about the the fund space, the private placement space in terms of real estate um, and then um, and also be able to meet a lot of the people that are active in the uh, in our community as well. So uh, that being said, I uh, uh, Cassie is actually going to is going to stop recording at uh, three o'clock, but 
I actually never have asked it, asked this question, Jack. What do you do for fun? So I love to travel, and uh, you know, I was fortunate during my time in private equity, Wall Street. You know, we we you know our servicing companies were on the West Coast, so we do a lot of West Coast travel between going to the, our service company sponsors. So I built up a ton of miles, mm -hmm. and I'm an avid follower of the Point Sky and the Boarding Area blog. So <laughs> I, I know almost every trick in the book for flying business in first class. And you know, my mm -hmm. goal is to fly like every major uh, you know product and and really to see the world. So. Um, I actually ended up doing an international uh, MBA as well. And I, I flew to Hong Kong probably 10 times. And, <laughs> you know, I flew Cathay Pacific first class. I threw, flew uh, Asiana first class. And it, it really, you know, allows me to see the world. And it makes, it makes the flying part part of the fun. And I've mm -hmm. taken these 12, 14, 16 hour trips that normally I would have dreaded or probably not taken the trip. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, fortunately now, you know, I have a, a lot of flexibility. I mean, most of our work is really on the initial vetting. And and once the deals happen, if I want to take a few weeks off, um, you know, I could certainly do that. I know I'm not getting a call about a toilet overflowing. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So travel is the major hobby. I, I will say I played pickleball for the first time yesterday and I feel like I'm, A, I know I'm officially getting old, but B, it's, it's actually a lot of fun. And I'm probably, uh, probably got a new, a, another hobby because uh, it was, I, I can see how it's addicting. Yeah. What's on the map next for you from a travel perspective? Uh, or like, where have you been always, actually, let, let's not talk about what you have on the calendar. Let's talk about what you want to have in the calendar that you've like never done before. Yeah, so got to do the South Africa trip, both, uh, you know, Cape Town for food and wine and, uh, you know, head up to, you know, Kruger, one of, you know, the, the national parks and do the safari. That, that's definitely one of the, you know, the more adventurous trips. And, uh, you know, for, from beach wise, I mean, M the Maldives, just from a purely checking it off the list of, uh, you know, of, of just doing, doing kind of th that epic, you know, I've, I've just read about it too many times. And then on a more, you know, it's very easy for me to get to Argentina using, I have these global upgrade certificates where I could basically buy economy and fly business class. So I've been to Buenos Aires twice. I want to do Patagonia and really see, I mean, Argentina is dirt cheap right now because there's, uh, you know, they've unfortunately for them have had a currency crisis. So, uh -huh. you know, you could be in Buenos Aires and you have, you know, a two pound steak and a bottle of wine for 12 US dollars. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a stack of Argentine pesos this big. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a great country. It feels almost like, it, it feels more like you're in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a very, you know, I think in the 20s and 30s, it was one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And unfortunately they've had, not to get too much into politics on this, but they've they've had you know I think uh, made some bad political decisions for the last fifty years, and uh -huh. uh, you know it's uh, un unfortunate. But uh, they just got a new uh, a new guy in who's really much more uh, you know fiscal responsibility, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens there. Hopefully things improve. But it's an amazing country, amazing people, and uh, mm -hmm. you know that's that's something. And I could basically work from there. It's it's one hour ahead of the East Coast, so oh, sweet. Um, it's, it's actually a great place to do more of the the Tim Ferriss kind of. Uh, digital nomad type of thing where I could function, I could work, internet's fast, and uh, you know, could see the country without really being truly on vacation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my one thing is I is uh, my wife and I love Italy a lot. Uh, we're actually going there back there, I think, for a fifth time, but it's going to be for a month in 2025 in May to June 2025. But we're going with a mission this time, and it is to get uh, dual citizenship status for my wife. Uh, whose grandmother was an Italian citizen. So uh, it's just something that uh, we feel is like a uh, important multi-generational asset to have. Um, and so we're gonna go there, not just to like, you know, travel this time, we're like gonna go there like to actually, you know, perform a task uh, to do that. And the one thing that's brutal about that is the time difference. Like there's like a small, it, you know, there's a small uh, sliver of time that you can really actually connect with uh, people that are on EST, for instance, whereas most of my business is. And I'm not any, an email or a text message guy. I'm like a phone call person or a Zoom call thing because there's a lot more information to get uploaded and downloaded through a phone call or just a conversation rather than like, you know, email and that sort of thing. So, uh, so I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to that as well. Awesome. Well, hopefully over the next year, you, uh, you know, get a little bit more passive and, and, you know, you've built some great processes for your business already. So hopefully you can get that next deal nailed down, have it set so you can uh, go on vacation in peace. All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, Cassie, I don't know if you're listening or not, but we can uh, hit the, uh, the stop record here. 
And then, um, oh yeah, and then also if you're listening here, we'll have the uh, link to the, uh, oh, thank, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Cassie. And then we'll have the uh, link in the show notes to the, um, to the uh, workshop, so you can get your tickets there. Thank you so much, and uh, peace. Thanks for coming on the show, Jack.